Good afternoon, Wilfred Spiegelenberg and Peter Basho here. Um, we're part of the PMC Uni Apache Unicorn group, um, designed the Apache Unicorn from scratch. Um, I've been doing Apache Unicorn since inception, about three years ago. And Peter? Uh, hi, my name is Peter Bochko. Uh, joined Cloudera in 2016, worked on Uzi, Hadoop, my produce yarn, and then um, joined the Unicorn team in 2021. So what we're going to talk about today is how we are using the scheduler framework to give you some batch extensions um, in the Kubernetes environment. So, like we said, we're coming out of the Hadoop, Yarn area, so batch processing, large data processing, and we're trying to give you the similar kinds of things within the setup around Kubernetes. So, what are the things that we're looking at when, when we look at uh, scheduling on, on Kubernetes? We want to do workload queuing. When, when batches get deployed, when batches get generated, we generate often a lot in one go. We want to keep them around. We want to start them whenever things will um, or need to be run. Um, we want to do an all-in-one kind of scheduling setup, gang scheduling. Uh, we don't sp spawn up one pod. We want to do a set of pods, which one is a driver, other are the workers. Um, Spark is a, is a good example for that, but there's other PyTorch, uh, IMP. There's, there's a number of things that will do that for you, um, things that are not available in, in standard things. The other um, extra bit that we want to give you is application sorting. So instead of looking at just one pod or a job or a daemon set, we say, no, no, there's a mixture of pods, uh, a group of pods that together form the application. We want to schedule based on the requests that come from, from that thing. It, it could be one pod to begin with, uh, scale up to 1,000 pods, and then drop down again to a couple of pods, like what we do with data processing. At the point in time that we need it, we, sc we scale up the pods, we do what we need to do, and the pods go away. So. We've got a real bursty kind of a um, deployment, but we, we still want to see all these pods being scheduled as part of one thing, not every single pod separately. So these kinds of schedulers, these kinds of facilities are there when you look at high performance, pro the HPC processing, the batch processing, when you come from a slurm or a, or a yarn kind of setup. So, these same kind of things we're going to do, or we want to do, from Apache Unicorn within Kubernetes. But Kubernetes, from its origins, was always a services-based setup. We want to do both at the same time. There's a number of schedulers that will give you some of the batch things that you want to do, but then they don't do the services. Or the other way around, when you use the default scheduler, you get the services, but you don't get the batch uh, things that you want to do. So Apache Unicorn, we schedule whatever you give us. So we put a replication on top of the existing pod objects, the applications, the, the daemon sets, whatever you want to run on, on a Kubernetes layer, we, we run on that. And then we also allow you to easily run Spark jobs, TensorFlow jobs, MPI jobs, whatever you want to do, without needing to change the underlying framework to submit your jobs. So we, we don't want to go in and need to run a specific TensorFlow setup or compiled from scratch because you want to do batch processing or the same with Spark. So, we, we want to give you a simple integration based on the minimum amount of code changes, preferably no code changes on the way that you submit an application, the way you submit a job, and purely use annotations and labels on, on pods or daemon sets or whatever you submit to schedule and give you the batch scheduling things. 
On top of that, when you start looking at data processing, there's always the question, where do I run it? How do I share my resources that I've got in my cluster? When you look at the default scheduler, you've got one scheduling queue. So a pod submitted by the first user or by the 10th user, it doesn't matter. They're all coming into one queue and it's getting scheduled based on a, on a priority kind of setup. Most data processing that you want to do is not looking at one user or five users, but you're looking at hundreds of users. You want to share the quotas, you want to share the system nicely. So Unicorn provides a hierarchical queue structure to place these applications in and do your, make your scheduling decisions. So instead of having one single queue that will contain all the pods for the whole cluster, you now can subdivide and then schedule subsets of the pods based on their own rules and their own priorities, first in, whatever you want to do. Within the hierarchical queue system, we give you the we give you handles to say these co these queues can only run an X number of pods or an X number of resources. But we also want you to be able to say with gu guaranteed this queue gets half of the cluster or it needs 10 of the nodes always. So every single point in that hierarchical, hierarchical queue, we can give you guaranteed resources, quotas, or different scheduling policies. So going from one possible policy throughout the whole cluster, we now give you a set that you can self-define and self-configure over the whole cluster. Now, when we started off, uh, working on Apache Unicorn, uh, there was no plugin architecture in Kubernetes. So before we, when we started, the, there was, the only way that you could really change things on the scheduler was completely replacing the scheduler. So we wrote our own scheduler, we implemented all the functionality for binding pods, doing all that kind of stuff, because that was the only way that we could do things. The next step was the extensions that were there for doing HTTP callouts, and then you could customize some of the behavior. Um, that didn't perform well, so that was pulled out of the, the Kubernetes code. And the next step that they came up with was the plugin architecture. Now, within the plugin architecture, they they gave you a number of extra things that you could play around with. So. Unicorn went from the standard deployment, like what we're running now, which is a complete custom scheduler, to a plugin architecture. So we started off with a simple core that does all the Unicorn core that does all the scheduling decisions, makes all the scheduling decisions. And then we've got a shim that integrates with the API server pulls the information in, does, does all the things with the pods and what we need to do. And we've got an admission controller sitting on top of that to do some of the more advanced stuff, making sure that things that it is as easy as possible for the end user. Moving to the plugin version of that, we changed over from doing everything within the core to having the shim that now completely includes the default scheduler. So instead of writing all the code to bind pods to the node and, and do the volume binding and everything ourselves, we now rely on the default scheduler to do all these things for us. So we hook into the scheduling framework, we implement certain points in there, and we augment or we replace whatever we don't want or what we want to change from the default scheduler. So, this is the picture that's probably had, um, for people that have been looking at the scheduling and the scheduler in Kubernetes that has sh uh, shown up before. Um, the right-hand side, the binding cycle, is the last point in the whole, s the whole cycle. That's where we leave things. The scheduling cycle, that's already been there, that's been there for a, for a long time. Um, that's what does the real checking, which node do we want, how do we place it on there, do all that kind of stuff. And then 
part of what is just come out in 126, 127, is the pre and Q um, plug-in side of things. So we worked with the scheduling SIG and we said, look, we want, we want to be able to do a little bit more instead of just having all the pods flow into the scheduling cycle immediately, we want to be able to gate the pods in a pre and queue cycle. So that has been delivered as part of, of 126. So how does Unicorn use these plugins and where, where, where do we sit? We've kept the Unicorn core. So our core scheduling code has not changed. So whatever we deploy, default mode, the, the standard mode, or the plugin framework, the Unicorn core still makes all the scheduling decisions. The only way that has changed between what we do with the plugin and the default mode is the way that we interact with Kubernetes and what we need to do ourselves and what the default scheduler does for us. So, the first part that we implement is the, the pre and queue plugin, because we want to be able to decide which ports the scheduler looks at and which ports that get put onto nodes and, and, and processed. So without the PNQ, there's a lot of overhead that flows through the whole system because we can't stop the default scheduler from, from looking at a port. That's just not built into the scheduling framework. And that meant that without the pre and queue hook, pods that Unicorn thought could not be scheduled yet, the default scheduler had already looked at and marked as unschedulable, and then the autoscaler kicks in and says, hey, I'm, I need a new node because this is marked as unschedulable. So that's where the, the, the pre and queue hook came from. Then the second point that we implement is the pre filter. The pre filter runs over all the nodes and decides which nodes to, to use and which nodes not to use. So that in combination with the filter hook allows us to select the nodes and make sure that the, the node is selected, is used, that we from the Unicorn core have decided on. The last bit that we implement is the post bind. That is the last point in the cycle, and when the post bind comes back, we know that the port is scheduled, completely accepted by the kubelet, and is getting started by the kubelet. So the post bind is a housekeeping point for us, because we know that everything has gone through and that we are at the final stage. So. The input from the core scheduling cycle goes into the first three plugins. So we decide what goes through, decide which node we put on, and for that we interact with the three plugins, the, the pre and queue, the pre filter, and the filter. Okay. With all of this, we want to do quotas and all these other things. Now, Peter will go into yeah. further all the quota tracking. Yeah, so let's talk about quotas. So as Wilfred mentioned, we have a hierarchical, uh, a hierarchical uh, model. It's a hierarchy of so-called uh, uh, resource queues. Uh, that's what we use to calculate the avail available resources um, to the running applications. Uh, these queues can be uh, created automatically. Uh, but also in, uh, in, config in configuration files, which is right now uh, YAM. Uh, we have to submit applications uh, or pods to the leave queues. You, you, cannot, you cannot run uh, stuff in the parent queue. And when the, whenever there's an allocation or there's a resource request, uh, we do the uh, counting in the leave queue, uh, increase counters, and uh, that uh, propagates up all the way uh, to the root queue. Uh, so this essentially means that uh, at any point uh, in the hierarchy, we always know always know the the resource usage. We um, we know the resource usage at, uh, at uh, for every for every subtree. Uh, you can put quotas um, on on leave queues uh, and, and and parent queues. And uh, since we know uh, the usage all the time, 
uh, it's very easy to enforce it, and we enforce it in every uh, scheduling cycle. So here is a very, very simple example. Uh, so th there's a cluster for developers and testers. Uh, leave queues are named after the users. Um, there are some running pods. Alice is running two pods, and Mallory is running uh, one pod. Uh, this is the current resource usage that can be observed. So obviously, root sees the, the total, which is 15 gigs of memory, 5 CPU, CPU, dev, 20 gigs of memory, 2 CPU, and QA, 30 gigs and uh, 3 CPU. And now we want to put some resource limit or quota uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the dev queue. Uh, uh, we want to limit the resource usage for the developers uh, 60 gigabytes of memory and four CPU. Uh, and also it's worth mentioning that uh, for the root queue, this is uh, calculated um, uh, automatically when the unicorn starts, uh, the nodes are uh, uh, re registered, um, and we just retrieve the, the capacity and later on we update it when a, a, node, join, a node joins the cluster or, uh, or leaves the cluster. Okay, um, and then Bob, Bob wants to run uh, a pod, but uh, unfortunately for him, uh, this pod cannot run, at least not at the moment. Uh, this is pending. Why? Uh, because of the, uh, of the limit. So this pod is asking for four CPUs. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the memory, but uh, the current usage at the dev queue is two CPU, and there's a, there's a limit for four CPU. And there's the and that's not enough. So so Bob has to wait uh, until uh, the pods that were started by Alice uh, terminate. And uh, it's important to uh, note, note that uh, the Bob's, Bob's pod is pending. It's not rejected. And uh, you will see why this is important. Okay. So namespace quotas versus unicorn quotas. But, uh, we can also use unicorn to manage namespace quotas. Why, why would we do that? Uh, so if you use namespace quotas, uh, we set it, uh, the quota is, uh, is exceeded, the pod is ejected, uh, end of story. And uh, if you want to run your workload, and probably you, you, you want to run it sometime later, you need, uh, you need some retry logic. It's a script, or you try manually, uh, and also, other users might be competing for, for resources too. And there is no, no ordering uh, between the users, so you, you might lose this race against um, uh, others. So it, this, is, um, this is not an ideal scenario. Uh, in Unicorn, you can have a setup uh, where the queues are uh, auto-created based on existing namespaces, so for here, here uh, the, uh, in this uh, example, sales, finance, dev, and test. These are existing namespaces. And Unicore created them when uh, a pod was uh, submitted. And in this case, the pods are not rejected. If there's, um, if there's no more room, uh, the quotas exceeded them, the users just had to wait. And um, when there is enough resource, then they will be picked automatically. Based on uh, based on the ordering that is set, uh, you have to set uh, so-called placement rules in order to have these queues uh, created, uh, and also you have to update the namespace object themselves. Uh, there are two annotations that you can use: uh, the the quota itself and uh, the parent queue. Uh, this, this arrow says that uh, the, the development and production queues are, are optional grouping, so that's not, not, as, that's not necessary. Uh, all uh, uh, the, the leaves can appear under root directly, so that's, that's not an issue, uh, but uh, sometimes this is, uh, this is desirable. So this is, um, so this is how it looks like uh, when you want to configure this. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, from the upstream uh, documentation, and it's uh, explained real well. So on the left side, there's the Unicorn config, the YAM. Uh, with, uh, in green, you can see the, st uh, the static use, the, the production and the development. Uh, this, is what, uh, this is what I uh, call the op optional. 
uh, we call them like sometimes configured queues or, or managed queues. Um, these queues always exist. They, they, they don't disappear until you remove them. Uh, in, the, uh, in the yellow, there's the placement rules section. And uh, if you have uh, used Apache Hadoop uh, before, Hadoop Yarn, uh, with fast scheduler or also capacity scheduler, it's uh, the very same idea. It's also called placement rules there. Um, you, you tell Unicorn how to name the queues that don't exist. Uh, and, and that's it. Then there are all kinds of rules, like name after the user, name after namespace, uh, some, maybe some labeling. So th there are different kinds of rules. And uh, these are the, uh, the orange. The, uh, this is, this, these are the two annotations that you have to put um, on, the, on the namespace object. Uh, the first is uh, is the quota. Is, a, is, is this is a tiny JSON, and the second one is uh, is the parent queue that uh, that uh, tells where um, the namespace queue should be created. And finally, uh, we also want to put quotas on users and groups, and um, this uh, this um, feature consists of uh, three parts. The first, uh, we have to determine uh, who submitted, submitted the actual workload. Uh, and it turns out uh, that this info is only available inside the admission controller. Uh, it's not present on the pod or deployment or any kind of other objects. Um, at least that's the only way what we found. Uh, you, need a, you need a mutate webhook. Uh, our, we have a mutate webhook. Uh, we extract this info uh, and we, we modify the we modified the pod spec uh, uh, of the workload, not just for pods, also for uh, deployment, job, cron job, um, XAP replication controller. So we had an extra annotation. Uh, this is also um, a tiny, tiny JSON. And later we deny changes to this annotation. Uh, you can you can fine tune this behavior, change it, but that's that's the basic idea. Uh, and then there's the tracking itself. Uh, uh, it's, it's the accounting, increasing, decreasing counters when there's an allocation or, or a port termination for the different groups and uh, users. And we have a nice REST API where this is visible. So we have separate endpoints for users and groups. And if you open uh, the user um, endpoint, you can see uh, th this user uh, total, and then you can see the per queue statistics where, uh, where that user is running uh, applications and uh, the usage. Uh, there will be a demo about that. And there is the third one, uh, which is not ready. Uh, the actual, this is the actual enforcement. Uh, so this is, um, uh, this is in progress. And uh, we targeted this for 1.3.0. The latest student conversion is 1.2.0. There's the Jira link. Uh, you can check it out. Um, it would be great. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, oh, I skipped over. Uh, preemptions. So one of the main things that we were missing in um, our current setups is how do we do preemption in, in this kind of a setup? Uh, if you do want to run one single port, you can preempt. But in this case, we've got a full queue hierarchy. So how do we decide what we do with preemption? Now, like the default scheduling cycles, we do preemption based on priority classes. The only thing is that we've added an opt-out from a unicorn perspective. So instead of saying that something is allowed to preempt during the scheduling cycle, we now say, don't preempt me when I'm already running. If you look at uh, jobs that are running, for instance, if you've got uh, a Spark job running or some other job running for a couple of days, and you kill the pod that belongs to that, that could be really costly. So you want to be able to opt out. That we allow that. We've got the queue configuration that we therefore needed. We max is the the quota, and we guarantee a certain amount of resources, which is the basis for preemption. Um, we've got some other nice, really complex things that we can do with fencing, so that you can say, 
certain parts of the hierarchies can't preempt other workloads. Um, for instance, you don't want to have production preempted because somebody in, starts something up in a dev or in a test environment. I'll skip over all of that. There's a presentation that was done during the HPC and Batch Day or from Tuesday that goes into that um, really elaborately and, and shows you with a full demo. demo. Um, on the bottom of the slide is the link to that presentation. So preemption within the, the system, we do that again as part of the normal scheduling cycle and we use the guaranteed resources for that. So again, within the, the, the setup of the queue system, we allow you to specify certain points in the, in the hierarchy and we give you a guaranteed amount of resources in the setup. So like a multi, multi tenancy fencing with priority offsets and all that, nice fancy things. There's a lot of documentation on the site. Um, goes a bit too far into them. What we can show you, and we're going to try a live demo here, uh, based on a kind cluster, we'll show you how we redistribute some of the um, some of the workload between the different queues and what we what we do. I've set up a small kind cluster to, to do that uh, for a three node cluster and I'm going to submit a simple application. The application is just a normal job with a couple of extra annotations on there from users to, lo to show what we want to do and where we want to run it. Now, let me create the application. So we create the application, we start up 10 pods, because of the quotas that we've set up, we can't run all of them. We can run eight out of the, the 10. The other two pots will just stay there and stay as um, pending. In the Unicorn Web UI, and now I've got, lost that one, we can, we can see that kind of information too. And, and the Web UI is gone. Okay. That's what you could, when you could do a live demo. Doesn't matter. We've set up the, the queues. We've got this all running. It runs in a low priority uh, setup. And now what we're going to do, we're going to uh, submit a high priority job uh, against it on the same system. It runs in a different queue. And it creates a number of high priority pods. These pods at first stay in pending because we don't, we're not going to directly preempt things. We wait a little bit to see what, what's going on. And then after the wait time is done, we are going to look for enough resources that will allow us to do what we want to do. So 30 seconds is, is the, the, the setup. And no, come back. And in the meantime, we'll see that we have redistributed some of the, the data. So here's the Unicorn Web UI. Um, we have created the, the queues. We've got a route with low priority, route with high priority. And within the queues, we have got the, the, the setup that we had first. And we have redistributed some of the load from route low to route high. Um, and when we reload, we should get the, the final state. And over time, we have moved, we've killed some of the root low, we moved that into root high. We've got a guaranteed quota sitting here. That means that we are going to preempt whatever we want and we need, but we are never going to preempt more than that we allow to. So we all, we've guaranteed that root low will always have this, this, these pots running. So we will give that. We don't go below that. And that also means that root high, which had a higher guaranteed, but we've only got eight CPUs, can't get to 
allocated to the, the maximum of the guaranteed that is there. So we still have got pending pots, but we've redistributed. Some of the high priority are running, some of the high priority are still pending. We've got low, low priority pending because they're still not being scheduled. They're just sitting there waiting for, for things to, to happen. Um, to hook that back in again to what Peter mentioned around the quotas. So we've got the quota tracking going through. The load for Peter runs in a root low. We see exactly what's happening here. Um, the second user is also tracked root high. We get the memory, we get everything. And then from the group, we were assigned, we both had assigned the same group. We see that both applications are tracked under that same group with root low and root high. So the total usage is there to, for everything, everybody to check. Now, if I now delete the first application, we will see that the leftover pods that were pending for the scheduler will get scheduled and will become running after a short amount of time. So we pick up where we were and we, we schedule whatever we have got as a leftover amount. So, that shows that what we do with the, within the scheduling framework. We've got full control over what we do with the pods, what we assign, which gets scheduled, where we place them, because in a kind cluster that's a little bit more difficult to see, but we have got full control over what, what gets placed where. And we also are able to do preemption based on the quotas what, that you set up that you want. So from a batch processing perspective, that gives you a full control over your environment you can say, I want certain users to have priority over other users. You can even say, um, Peter is not allowed anything in, in one queue or the other queue. So you can do a full-blown multi-tenant environment within the system that we're going to set up. So this was the, the, the cluster that we used. We had a prepared cluster quotas and preemption. Um, the applications that got submitted were one for the user, Peter, one for the other user, and we saw the redistribution of the quota to the other user. And we hopefully have some time left over for Q&A if there's any further questions. All right. There's a microphone on the side for the, for the people that are streaming, uh, because I was told that there were a couple of people that were streaming. So if you could go to the microphone, please. Hello. Yeah. How do you um, say, like, with driver and executors in Spark, how do you stop the driver being preempted? So, the, the main thing is the priority class that you set on the, on the driver. Um, and within the priority class, you opt out from the preemption. So that's, that's the first thing. The other thing that we do is when you submit a, a Spark driver and other things, uh, we create an application object. Within the application object, we mark the first pod as the originator pod. That's the one that gets created first. The, also, the originator pods, even if it doesn't have the allow preemption tag set, always gets put, put in the back of the queue for preemption. So we try our best not to preempt the driver pod. Um, it's not a guarantee. It's a bit of like, Yes, we put it always in the back of the queue. If we can't do anything else, then we will still kill the driver pod. Yeah. Thank you. And um, 
the demo you showed, yeah. were those two applications running with the same priority class? No, no. So they were running with a different priority class. One was running with low priority. That was the one from in the, in the, the first queue that we set up. And the second one was with high priority. If I would have submitted a third application while the first low priority was running, and I would put in a third application also with low priority, the second application would have been scheduled first, not only because it's a higher priority, but we also put FIFO on the system, so first in, first out. But you can decide that anywhere in the queue hierarchy. So if you say, uh, I want to schedule certain part of the queue first in, first out, but the other part of the queue I want to schedule fairly or purely based on priority, you can do that. That's, that's all set up and all available within the queue hierarchy. So it's not just one policy, it's policy per part of the queue that you set up. Okay, so um, one more question. So if I had two applications of the same priority class running, yep. well, I ran one and it had a guaranteed resource of X, but it filled the cluster. And I ran my second one, and I had the set guarantee resource, but the same app, the priority class, would resources preempted from application one and given to application two, yep. such they both had at least yes. a guarantee. Yep. All right, yep. thank you. Yep. If, if they're exactly the same priority, yes. Yeah, we will still do that. We distribute again over, over the two applications. I have two questions. Yeah. One is how does this compare with Q, the Q with K that yeah. was also being shown? Like if you can broadly see the advantages and disadvantages of, of both. And the second one has actually to do with this uh, part, which I, it was not clear to me if you wanted, if you have some kind of implementation for fair usage and if it has like something fancy like the, cl the classical job schedulers do, which can kind of have in, how much have you used in the past uh, with a kind of a, uh, so, a lifetime kind of? Um, we, we don't look at lifetime, so to say, so, um, we, because we don't know. Um, when, when you run, for instance, a Spark job or whatever, we've got no idea what, what comes in. Um, you can ask for gang scheduling, but okay. you ask for a certain amount of resources. We try to do our best and give you all the resources that you ask for. If we can't, you as the application submitter can say, um, do I want to proceed with whatever I can get or do I just want to fail? So soft or hard gang scheduling. So that's the only thing that you've got when, when you look at that side of things. Um, compared to Q, I think Q is not hierarchical, so it has a set of queues, but the hierarchy and, and the, the, the way that we distribute with guaranteed. Um, the other thing, Q, when it does preemption, it preempts the whole job. It can't do one pot at a time. It, it can't do distributions like that. It, it does the whole job or nothing. So that's not as flexible. Um, Sharing quotas um, in the, when you look at what we do in a setup like you see here, we can share quota from QA all the way to the other side. That is not possible with uh, Q. You've got a group of, co group of queues that you've set up beforehand. Um, so the, the flexibility is not there as much uh, within the, the queue uh, setup. Thanks a lot. Any further questions? No? Oh. Hello. Um, so when you leave the pod impending, is the application able to determine that the pod is impending because there's not enough resource available and it's, and it's effectively queued compared to it's impending because some secret it needs isn't there or some other reason why it might not be impending? Yeah, so we, we use the event system and we put events on the pods to show you that the uh, 
pod is waiting for resources to become available. Yeah, we do that. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. That was it then.